So if you want to watch the full Kamala Harris CNN interview, you have to watch three highly edited separate videos on CNN's YouTube channel. This is the reason why no one likes CNN. How can you trust a news station to give you reliable news if they can't release the full interview of a presidential candidate? But I'm sure they're finding out CNN is uh, getting about as destroyed in the comments section as Kamala Harris is. Because this is the worst interview I've seen a presidential candidate give. And I'm not joking. I'm not saying this because I'm biased or anything and love Trump. To start, Tim Walls held her hand the whole time and maybe spoke of a couple times. He should not have been there. It makes her look weak, which she is. Also, if you start off an interview by not even knowing what the first thing you're going to do in office as president is, you have a problem. I mean, granted, she is in office now, so no matter what she says she wants to do, uh, she could do it right now. But it was basic questions she was asked with the biggest word salad responses that would make even a Democrat raise their eyebrows. The voters are really eager to hear what your plans are. If you are elected, what would you do on day one in the White House? Well... There are a number of things. I will tell you, first and foremost, one of my highest priorities is to do what we can to support and strengthen the middle class. Um, when I look at the aspirations, the goals, the ambitions of the American people, I think that um, people are ready for a new way forward um, in a way that generations of Americans have been fueled by, by hope and by optimism. I think, sadly, in the last decade, um, we have had in the former president someone who has really been pushing an agenda and an environment that is about diminishing um, the character and the strength of who we are as Americans, uh, really dividing our nation. And I think people are ready to turn the page on that. So what would you do day one? Day one, it's going to be about, one, implementing my plan for what I call an opportunity economy. Getting asked what the first thing you're going to do should not be difficult. Dana literally had to re-ask the question because giving a response of rebuilding the middle class is way too standard issue of a response. The only thing she then goes on to list is talking about child tax credit, which was Trump's idea. He wants 5000 and she wants 6000 so I guess Kamala is trying to start a bidding war and copy all of Trump's policies. But because of how bad the response was, Dana had to ask the man. Man, Tim Walls. Uh, I don't know where the feminists are for that. Um, imagine being a presidential candidate getting asked what your policies are, then asking the VP what the policies are because of how bad of a response it was. I can feel the weakness hundreds of miles away. It's embarrassing. What about you? Well, I'm excited about this agenda, too. As I said, the idea of uh, inspiring America to what can be. And I think many of these things that the vice president's proposing are, are, uh, are things that we share in values. And the child tax credit is one we know that reduces childhood poverty by a third. We did it in Minnesota to have a federal partner in this. Um, unbelievable, I think, in the impact that we can make. Not even he could answer the question. Maybe he needs to start asking Kamala what her policies are so he could answer questions because he's a better interviewer than her. I know that for a fact, but he's turning into Kamala now. One of your campaign themes is we're not going back. But I wonder what you say to voters who do want to go back when it comes to the economy specifically because their groceries were less expensive, housing was more affordable when Donald Trump was president. Well, let's start with the fact that when Joe Biden and I came in office, it, during the height of a pandemic, we saw over 10 million jobs were lost. Uh, people, I, I mean, literally, we were all tracking the numbers. Hundreds of people a day were dying because of COVID. Um, the economy had crashed. Uh, in large part, all of that because of mismanagement by Donald Trump of that crisis. When we came in, our highest priority was to do what we could to rescue America. And today, we know that we have inflation at under 3%. A lot of our policies have led to the reality that America recovered faster than any wealthy nation around the world. But you are right. Prices, in particular for groceries, are still too high. The American people know it, I know it. Uh, 10 million jobs lost. We got all those jobs back. Many died due to COVID. Ah, uh, mismanagement. Trump's fault. Okay, I just realized I'm probably sounding more like Roz from Monster Inc., but, I mean, that's not my fault. That's what she's starting to sound like more and more. But COVID was the governor's fault. All the governors, including the Republicans, should take responsibility for closing their entire state for believing such crap of staying in your house fixes the problem. If I recall, if you walk away from a problem, that problem only gets bigger. That's exactly what happened. And, yeah, I don't think these wasteful spending bills should have passed either under the Trump 
administration. But the constant blaming of Trump for COVID and deaths, even though they had more deaths under her administration, people realized that was a big talking point in the last election cycle that, oh, all these people died under Trump. More people died under the Biden administration now. But you cannot count getting the 10 million jobs back that were lost just because the state was locked down. That is cheating. Which is why my agenda includes what we need to do to bring down the price of groceries. For example, dealing with an issue like price gouging. What we need to do to extend the child tax credit to help young families be able to take care of their children in their most formative years. What we need to do to bring down the cost of housing. My proposal includes what would be a tax credit of $25,000 for first-time home buyers, so they can just have enough to put a down payment on a home, which is part of the American dream and their aspiration, but do it in a way that allows them, them to actually get on the path to achieving that goal and that dream. So you have been vice president for three and a half years. Yeah. The steps that you're talking about now, why haven't you done them already? Well, first of all, we had to recover as an economy, and we have done that. I'm very proud of the work that we have done that has brought inflation down to less than 3 percent. The work that we have done to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for seniors. Donald Trump said he was going to do a number of things, including allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Never happened. We did it. So now, and I, as I travel in the state of Georgia and around our country, the number of seniors that have benefited. I've met, I was in Nevada recently, a, a, a grandmother who showed me her receipts. And before we capped the cost of insulin for seniors at $35 a month, she was paying hundreds of dollars, up to thousands of dollars a month for her insulin. She's not doing that so anymore. You maintain Bidenomics is a success. I maintain that when we do the work of bringing down prescription medication for the American people, including capping the cost of the annual cost of prescription medication for seniors at $2,000, when we do what we did in the first year of being in office to extend the child tax credit so that we cut child poverty in America by over 50 percent, when we do what we have done to invest in the American people in bringing manufacturing back to the United States so that we created over 800,000 new manufacturing jobs, bringing business back to America, what we have done to improve the supply chain so we're not relying on foreign governments to supply American families with their basic needs, I'll say that that's good work. There's more to do. But that's good work. Three of the four years of her administration had inflation outpaced wage growth. And as I've stated multiple times, when you claim inflation decreased to 3%, you're saying you increased your body weight to 500 pounds and said you're slowly stopping gaining weight now. But you're still fat and going to die soon. But even Dana cut through all the price gouging and tax credit BS that she keeps bringing up every two seconds. Was Bidenomics successful in your opinion, yes or no? Then she goes back to talk about child tax credit again, and it's all good work. She's dancing around questions like a fairy godmother. The fact that she couldn't say yes to that is pretty embarrassing because this is her policies. I want to get some clarity on where you stand on some key policy issues. Uh, energy is a big one. When you were in Congress, you supported the Green New Deal. And in 2019, you said, quote, there is no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. Fracking, as you know, is a pretty big issue, sure. particularly in your must-win state of Pennsylvania. Sure. Do you still want to ban fracking? No, and I made that clear on the debate stage in 2020, that I would not ban fracking. As vice president, I did not ban fracking. As president, I will not ban fracking. In 2019, I believe, uh, at a town hall, you said you were asked, would you commit to implementing a federal ban on fracking on your first day in office? And you said, there's no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. So yes. So it changed in, the, in that campaign? In 2020, I made very clear where I stand. We are in 2024, and I've not changed that position, nor will I going forward. I kept my word, and I will keep my word. What made you change that position at the time? Well, Let's be clear. My values have not changed. I believe it is very important that we take seriously what we must do to guard against what is a clear crisis in terms of the climate. And to do that, we can do what we have accomplished thus far, the Inflation Reduction Act. What we have done to invest, by my calculation, over probably a trillion dollars over the next 10 years, investing in a clean energy economy. What we've already done, creating over 300,000 new clean energy jobs. That tells me, from my experience as vice president, we can do it without banning fracking. In fact, Dana, Dana, excuse me, um, I cast the tie-breaking vote. 
that actually increased leases for fracking yeah. as vice president. So I'm very clear about where I stand. And was there some policy uh, or scientific data that you saw that you said, oh, okay, I get it now? What I have seen is that we can, we can grow and we can increase a thriving clean energy economy without banning fracking. Okay. Do you know what she literally could say so she stops getting asked a question on why do you flip-flop on your positions? She could say I was wrong. She could say I've seen the data that led me to change my position. You'd get a whole lot more respect from them just saying things like, ah, I've kept my word. I'm going to keep my word. My values have not changed. We can do what we have accomplished thus far. Just a bunch of jargon, and this was part one of the interview. So if you guys want me to do the other two, let me know. But that's enough brain cells lost for the day. This is the worst interview of all time.